Welcome, I'm Pastor Chris Rue. Welcome here to Word of Life Christian Center. So great to be with you. And uh, we're going to wrap up our series in the book of Ruth. Everybody get it out of your system. Are you telling me that you can't handle the... There we go. Yeah, I got you. So... We're going to pack a lot into this last thing we because we have so many beautiful images that intersect. We've been building kind of towards this moment, and uh, we're going to ask for the grace of God. Uh, it's been quite, um, quite an intense week. Uh, uh, just not only the events unfolding so much and just uh, trying to keep, uh, as we're dialoguing with people over in the Middle East, and, uh, but then also having things here. Uh, just had a, we had a funeral yesterday that Pastor Dave Shanos did, and staff tending to family and all of that. So it's been very, very interesting, very full. Um, so uh, we're going to ask God to help us, right? Listen, I don't know about you, but I want to hear from Jesus this morning. I don't, I don't need me. I don't need cuteness or whatever. I, I, need, I need the gospel. I need the power of the living word to come and change me. I need to see the Lord more clearly, and I need the dross to be pulled back from my eyes. I need my spiritual cataracts to be operated on so that the lamp of this body is good, right? So let's pray together. So Father, we just thank you. Lord, we need you. And Lord, I'm I'm asking God, I'm I'm asking selfishly, I'm asking for me. Lord, I, I need you. Lord, that your power would be perfected in this weak vessel. Lord, you are the treasure in this earthen vessel. Lord, I thank you for what you have blessed me to be able to do this morning. And I don't take it lightly and nor do I take it as some heavy obligation. I take it as just my suitable response to you to declare your glory and your majesty through your word. So Lord, open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears to behold the lamb. In your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm gonna ask, um, I'm actually gonna do this a little bit earlier, different than last service. I'm gonna ask my volunteers, could you make your way to the stage just as I begin to get us set up and I don't mind the hustle and the bustle while you come up, all right? Okay, so here we go. So we have, we're in the book of Ruth, and uh, we are kind of uh, putting an exclamation point on this sentence that we've been doing here for the last few weeks. And uh, so what do we do? We began the book of Ruth by basically stating, as we saw it, that this book takes place during the time of the judges, right? Yes. Eyes here. <laughs> <laughs> it takes place around the time of the judges, which the reason we're told that is because uh, what we're being instructed in is that you have to understand Ruth, and the only way you can understand it is by looking at it through the lens of the book of Judges. And so with that came a couple of things. I just want to remind you about them because we're going to really see all these things wrapped up here today. Uh, number one is that in the book of Judges, the commandments are a very, very big deal, and it's specifically it's the commandments are consistently broken, Right? Yes, if the book of Judges is a light, it goes out after the first chapter, right? It's awful. Um, and many of you have told me you started reading it after we started doing Ruth, and you're like, hey, caramba, right? Um, but then as you, as you go on, we see here in the book of Ruth that also the commandments are a big deal. In fact, we talk about uh, the commandments, but here in this book, we see that they're not looking to be broken, but they're looking to be what? Honored. Yes? Yeah, okay. Look at me like you haven't been here. All right. All right, so secondarily, what are, what are other things that we see in the book of Judges that we, we have to ask ourselves about the book of Ruth? And that is that during, uh, in the background of many of the J- book of Judges, um, in the background story of many of the deliverers in the book, like Gideon, uh, Jephthah, uh, Samson, and, and others, in the background of their stories are these deliverance festivals that Israel celebrates, like Passover, Pentecost, uh, something called Sukkot, or Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles. And so when you look at those stories that, that they're based out of, which is God's deliverance of Israel, and then you look at the deliverer in front of you, you see that there's a really a massive contrast between the God who delivers and the qualities of the person we're looking at, right? That we see both their strengths, but we also see many of their glaring faults. Okay, so it provides real, real contrast. So if we have deliverance feasts in the book of Ruth, what are they telling us? What is it bringing us into? And what, what are we meant to see? In some of the stories in Judges, there were marriages that looked like they were going to happen or not, but they never really come about. So there's a failed, ma- failed marriages in the book of Judges, but do we see a marriage in the book of Ruth? 
Okay, yeah, okay, why? Why is that able to work? All right, women are treated awfully in the book of Judges. Why are women treated well in the book of Ruth? Why does Ruth get its own book? And then the last thing is, is wow, man, at the end of Judges, Bethlehem is all known for spiritual idolatry. It's known for a concubine that's sexually assaulted. It's just an awful story. And even the beginning of the book of Ruth, right? It's, it's a man named Elimelech who's leading his family during a time of where the, the commandments of God are being broken in Bethlehem, and he's leaving. And so it's a whole picture of sin and exile, if, if you will. And he's from Bethlehem. And so we're like, man, what will the legacy of Bethlehem be? What, is this going to be the final story when it comes to Bethlehem? And why do we see such sorrow and loss? So all those things are wrapped up. And, of course, why does Ruth get its own book? You know, why can't it just be in Judges if it took place during Judges? So we need to answer all those questions and more here today. So what I want you to do is if you have a Bible, you can open up to Ruth chapter 4. If you have a device, do it to it. What's well, going to be on the screen? Open your device. Get in the habit. Make sure you touch it on that Bible app, right? Right? Because we hashtag. That's right. And not just on Sundays. Okay? All right. So let's get rolling. We're going to go to Ruth chapter 4. And I'm going to read here a good part of the chapter, but we're going to narrate the story, set it up, and then we're going to get a little illustrative, as you may have picked up. Aren't we glad to have Boaz back from last week? Boaz, all right. Boaz. Hopefully you're as good as last week. Okay, so here we go. Ruth chapter 4. And where we left off last week, we saw was that, that Boaz and Ruth had this encounter but this encounter was very similar to both of their pasts, right? And so what was going to happen? Would they move in the deception of the past? Or would they do things with honesty and integrity? And we saw that they did things in honesty and integrity. And because of that, Boaz looked at Ruth, because Ruth's family name is about to be eliminated. Uh, Ruth is, hey, you, you're the next, you're the closest relative that, that I know of. Will you take me as a wife? And will you have a child with me to keep the name of my husband going? And Boaz said, I'm willing, right? And so that's where we were left. We're like, oh, a wedding. Da, 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 da. I just read differently, maybe. All right. So Ruth 4, chapter, verse 1, pardon me. Now Boaz, he's going to resolve this issue. Boaz went up to the gate. Everyone say gate. All right, now I have you say these things on purpose because we will revisit them. And sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by because he said there was somebody else that was actually had right before him. So Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down, and he took how many men? Okay. Of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So that means when they left, they got rid of the land. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders, my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. And for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I'm next after you. And he said, the man said, I'll redeem it. Okay, so the land has been sold. Naomi doesn't have it anymore. She's not, it's not in her name. We don't have any perpetuation of the family line. But there's this provision in Leviticus 25 that if there is a family member close, akin, he can step in and pay the price and get the land back. It's redeemed or the kinsman redeemer. Okay? So now we left off, just to note, with in chapter 3 with, oh, we're going to have a wedding but none of the talk yet is about Ruth. It's, about a, it's a real estate transaction, right? So verse 5. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi. Let me just throw this in there. You must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Here's the addendum in the contract. Verse 6. And the close relative said, uno momento pre favor. I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. 
Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sliders, right? No, sandals, and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are what? Say it again. You are? Very, very important. This day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's who we lost in chapter 1, and all that was for his, his sons, Killian and Malon, from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth, the Moabite Tess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. The name of the dead may not be what? That the, cut off from among his brethren and from among his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. So Boaz is like, I'm buying everything, and I know exactly what I'm doing. Now let's wrap this up here. Verse 11, and all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord, listen to this, make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah. Now this is profound because Ruth is a Gentile from outside of Israel, and now they're saying, may she be like Rachel and Leah, who are the wives of Jacob, whose name is Israel. This is significant. They're talking like she's part of the family. The two who built the house of Israel, and may you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem, same place. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. Let's hang in there. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative. Didn't Ruth birth the son? Why are they talking to Naomi? And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you the restorer, a restorer of life and nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who was better to you than seven sons has borne him. They and Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave her a name saying, this, there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So this whole story has landed with this beautiful point that this child that is born, that has come through Boaz's redemption of the property and of Naomi's name and of Ruth has all led to the birth of Obed, who is the father of Jesse, who was the father of King David, from whom Messiah or Jesus would come. So what it's letting us know is that when you read the book of Ruth, all of this has been so that the Messiah in the fullness of time would be born of a virgin. Which means as we look back to Ruth and we look back through the book, there ought to be some things in everything that I've just talked about, all the questions I asked, they ought to all point to Jesus in some magnanimous way. So we ready to do this? One, two, three, get Rue now. Here we go. I'm going to do this. We're going to move a little bit. So what's the first thing that happened? Boaz, if you can come here. So let me help out. So we've, we've got some people here. And you imagine, like, what, what, are they, what are they doing up here? I'm going to ask you guys to, okay, please keep your face down. And then I'm going to try and guess what number you have after I... You never know what you're going to sign up for here. All right, so what we're doing, Boaz, right, says, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to do this act of redemption. And he comes to the city gate, right? The gate is where decisions were made, government uh, decisions type things were done, um, affairs were conducted. But now what happens is Boaz brings the elders of the city here so they can be a witness, right? Yes, yes, we just read it, Pastor Christian. Yes, yeah. Okay, so they're here to witness, and what they're doing, as Boaz goes through the whole ceremony that we just read, the elders here are looking, and they're saying, Boaz is a credible kin. We, we, we affirm that Boaz is of the kinship. He has the ability, he has the right to redeem the, the plot of land that was sold, Naomi, and Ruth. 
Not only that, but we, we witness that he actually has the money to make the purchase and to carry out the transaction. Not only that, but Boaz has communicated in our midst that he is willing to do it. And so all of us are testifying that he is willing and he's qualified. You with me? All right. Now, let's think about this. Naomi and Ruth, they've come back, but they don't have a land or a place to dwell in because what? Naomi sold it when Elimelech and those guys left. In other words, it was during a time of drought, which means that the consequences of breaking the covenant were they're there. And so they were kind of, it was like an exile from the land. Right? Okay, so now they, because of sin, they left or they were exiled, right? And now they're trying to come back. And so this whole thing is hinging on Boaz. And Boaz said he is willing. And the witnesses here and the elders are saying, you're authorized to do it. Now, how many elders were there that he called to the city gate? Can we put our numbers up, please? Now remember, what's one of our first questions? If the commandments, if the commandments were a big deal in Judges, are they a big deal in this book? Come on, there were, they sojourned in Moab for 10 years. We talk about the number of times that Ruth is mentioned, 10 times, and there's, there's all these different numbers, 10 in the book, I'm just kind of going from memory, but there's all this of 10. Why? Because 10 is important. 10 speaks of the law or 10 speaks of the commandments. Think about this. We have two people who have been exiled and are trying to come back and be redeemed so that their name isn't cut off. And what's happening? We have 10 elders. And what are the 10 elders saying? Boaz is willing. Boaz is authorized. What is this all telling us? You have the 10 commandments or the Mosaic law. And what they're testifying to is that there is a man who's qualified to stand here. There is a man who has a redemption price that he can pay. And he is able to save Naomi. And he is able to redeem Ruth. And he's able to bring them out from exile and have a place. We bear witness that this man is qualified. This man is worthy. His name is Jesus, and the law testifies that he can save you and he can save me. But now let's really kick it up a notch. That's just general. Let's get prophetically specific with the scriptures. How has Boaz been when he's interacted with Ruth and Naomi? Has he met the law, or has he gone above and beyond as we've read the book? He's gone above and beyond. He's been generous, a generous spirit. Ten is mentioned all throughout the book. Ten is a picture of the commandments or the law. Do you know how many times Boaz's name is mentioned in the book of Ruth? Twenty. Or two times. Meaning, you have the law in the book but there's a man who exceeds the law. There's a man who doesn't just meet the requirements of the law, but he's greater than the law. It gets better. At the end of chapter 3, Ruth is like, will you redeem me? Will you take me as a wife? That's what we're left with. But what's the conversation about in chapter 4? Real estate. And the real estate is not in the name of Ruth, it's in the name of who? Naomi and Elimelech. Meaning these are Israelites who lost the land. Why? Because they violated the commandments. Meaning that if you can't honor the law, you'll experience exile from the land. Naomi is a picture of Israel violating the commandments and you no longer can dwell in the land according to the law because if you can't honor me and keep the law, you'll be exiled from the land. However, God has made a provision for Naomi to be able to come back. Even though you sold it, even though you left, there's a means. There has to be a man who's from the same family. There has to be an Israelite. There has to be a Hebrew who is here. He's of the tribe of Judah. He's a Bethlehemite, and he has got to be here and willing to redeem. And we heard Boaz said, I am willing. 
He has to be able to keep the entirety of the law. In fact, he's a man who's greater than the law. There's a man here. There's a Jewish man here. There's a Hebrew here. There's an Israelite who was able to say to Naomi, who was also an Israelite, I can save the land and I can bring you back into the land. Why is Jesus from the line of the tribe of Judah? Why is he a Hebrew? It is significant. Why? Because only he can resolve the issue of the Mosaic law. Only he can bring Israel back into the land because he is their kin. Oh, but hear me, it gets better. What, you, what we see in, the, in chapter 4 is not Ruth first. It's Naomi But in the process of redeeming the land, who's brought into the story? Ruth. This is the gospel. Jesus is the son of God who has appeared in the fullness of time, who is greater than the Mosaic law, and he is able to resolve the issue of Israel. He's able to resolve the issue of the land, and in the process of resolving and redeeming the land and the people, he has also brought the nations in, pictured in Ruth. Folks, you and I are brought into the story, we're brought into the marriage, we're brought into the covenant because he is the lion of the tribe of Judah who has laid down his life, paid the redemption price, saved Israel, and saved the nations for all who believe in him. And he has redeemed for himself a land by which where he will sit and rule as king of kings and lord of lords forevermore on the throne of David. All smack dab in four chapters in the book of Ruth, we have the majesty of the gospel. And if we're from the nations, we're brought in in Boaz's redemption. Isn't that awesome? Hey, now, check this out. Why is Naomi even here in the first place? It's because Ruth put faith in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And even when we read the story, when Naomi said, I'm bitter, I've lost everything. I'm I'm Mara, Mara, right? You guys remember that? Okay. Ruth says, it's okay. I put my faith in the God of Israel. And now let me walk you back to the land. And it's actually Ruth's faithfulness to go and pursue What the fulfillment of the commandments that becomes a witness to Naomi that pulls her back into the redemption story. It's a prophetic picture of even the events unfolding now and that will unfold in the future. It's the church in the nations that will stand with Israel in her darkest moments and say, I'm not relating to you based upon your performance. I'm relating based to you on covenant. And God has promised he has brought redemption for you. He's brought redemption for the land. And he will bring in the nations and he will bring it all. And the glory of God will fill the earth. (laughs) Ruth is a witness that there is a church in the nations that will love and intercede for Israel even in the hardest hours, even while they're bitter and bring them to the foot of the one who can heal and restore them. That's the gospel. Well, Pastor, I I don't know. It's all over the book. And it just so happens that this message falls on this Sunday. Like somehow in the fullness of time I could have scheduled that. No. It's the beauty of the gospel. It's the beauty of Jesus. So, what else do we have here? Let's see. We've got Boaz. We've got redemption. He's a picture of Jesus. But it's very interesting. Ruth comes to Israel in the midst of the barley season. You may barley remember that, but it was, (laughs) right? Chapter 1. And barley is associated with the Passover. It's one of the first things offered at the beginning of Passover because it's right around the time of the beginning of the barley harvest, right? But then in chapter 2, it tells us that she gleans from Boaz in his field, starting at barley, but going all the way through the wheat harvest. Now, wheat, the wheat harvest, is Pentecost. So Ruth has a Passover feast and a what? what? Pentecost, right? Feast, right? So now remember I said there are feasts and celebrations, right, in the book of Judges. So 
let's kind of do this for a moment. So I need to do this in three stages, all right? First stage, slightly animated. Second stage, more animated. Third stage, full-on cartoon. <laughs> okay, here we go. Why are deliverance feasts important, right? So we have the Passover feast, which is what the Lord did when God made a promise to Abraham through grace to bring the seed and, and so forth. He says, when they were in Egypt and under Pharaoh, God remembered his word. And God said, hey, I'm going to deliver you out of bondage and there's plagues and there's wonders and there's all this stuff to see them set free from Pharaoh. And it culminates with what a Passover lamb that is slaughtered and the blood is applied to the doorposts. And all those who have the blood on the doorposts, the angel of death, what passes over, and it sets in motion deliverance. And that deliverance shows itself as they run from the Pharaoh and it ends up where the Red Sea is parted. And they go through, and God makes a way for them to go through. But then the Egyptians pursue, and that same sea becomes death to them. So the people, or the Hebrews, pass through death, but the Egyptians cannot. You with me on that? All right. So they come out, and they don't just come out as all Hebrews. You actually have Egyptians who join them. You have other nations that join them, because Exodus tells us, and you read it, that they came out a mixed people. Meaning that there was a diversity of ethnos or ethnicity of different nations all together. Now, that happens at Passover, and then they come along 50 days later, and they come to Mount Sinai, and the fire and the glory and the cloud that had been leading them shows up on the mountain, and the divine man who is in the cloud and in the fire steps on the mountain. And what comes down are the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 fire. Now that cloud is like a canopy over the mountain, or what would be called a hoopah. The Ten Commandments are like a wedding contract. And what the Lord says is after Passover is like, hey, you're diverse, but you're my family. So you're all now Israel. Here's the wedding canopy, and here's the wedding contract. I'm betrothing myself to you. And this word is a sign that I will fulfill my promises, right? So we with all that, that, that's Passover imagery, Pentecost imagery. So then when you get to the book of Judges, you have a Passover and Pentecost imagery that uh, don't turn out so well. So very, very quickly, the first one is a man named Jephthah in Judges 11. And you have these people from Gilead. They're like, Jephthah, you need to deliver us. We're, we're being besieged by these people called the Ammonites. And Jephthah says, yes. And it says he passes through to defeat the enemies. And the word pass through is the same way that the angel of death passed through. It's the same wording intentionally to let you know this is Passover imagery. Well, Jephthah must be a great guy. He's so excited about his victory, he says, I'm going to sacrifice the first thing I see to the Lord when I get back. First thing he sees is actually a person, and it's his daughter. And his daughter says, Dad, whatever vow you've made, fulfill. But let me go for two months into the mountains. And mourn the fact that I'm never going to get married. And so the story ends not with the preserving of his firstborn, but the loss of his firstborn. And it ends without a wedding. You with me? After two months. Then you have the story of Samson. Big, muscle bound. Samson's so strong, his jeans are ripped, right? <laughs> but Samson's a very broken man in his character. Leads his parents into sin in the book, Right? Loses his strength because of, of everything. But Samson's trying to marry a Philistine woman who's a Gentile, so Hebrew Gentile. But his bride is, is killed in the story, and there's fire in his story during the wheat harvest or Pentecost. But his bride dies, the fire destroys, and it ends up with Samson killing himself and 3,000 people dying. So there's no wedding, obviously. So we have those type of feasts, which are very different from the ones we started with. But now we've got to come to the time of Boaz and Ruth. When Ruth meets Boaz, it's during the what? Passover. And during the Passover, how does Boaz treat Ruth? With generosity, with grace, with more than what the law requires. So in light of Passover, we see Boaz as magnified, right? Not only that, but as we move, as the story moves along, at the end of the wheat harvest, we now have someone saying, I commit myself to being your husband. I betrothed myself, what, to you. 
Jesus on Passover is super generous with you and me in that he lays his own life down upon the cross and willingly lays it down. What? To be generous with his blood, which is the redemption price for you and me. He lays his life down willingly and generously to save you and me. Oh, oh, oh. 50 days later, what happens? Fire from heaven comes down in Acts chapter 2, not so that the word is provided, but so that the word that we read can be emblazoned across your heart and my heart that we might walk in his ways. We don't deserve this, but God is more than generous. He's more than the law requires. He goes above and installs the Holy Spirit inside you and me. Folks, he has been generous. And so we have a Passover feast and we have a Pentecost feast because why? The Lord pours out the Holy Spirit. Why? I betrothed myself to you. Israel, I'm going to fulfill all my promises to bring you into the land. I have paid the price and there's coming a day when you will dwell in the land free from any harm from any enemies because I will be in your midst and the nations who are also brought into the story will come and worship me and honor me. I've pulled in the nations, I've pulled in you and I'm giving the Holy Spirit to show you that's the ring I'm putting on it and I'm faithful to my word. There's a day coming. This spirit says you've been bought with a price that is not your own. Therefore, live in a way that honors me because I am your husband. I'm the bridegroom of Sinai and there's coming a day when I will split the clouds and I will come in and we will live together forever. So when we look at Passover and Pentecost in Ruth, we see the magnification of Boaz to show us that there is a man that the law testifies to who is Lord of Passover, Lord of Pentecost, and more than generous with you and me. Boom, shakalaka. I'm just going to enjoy myself for a second. Now, so we've got the Ten Commandments. We've got a man committed to a wedding. And the reason he handles Ruth well and the reason women are treated well is because the word of God and the commandments live inside his heart. It's not just about what you know, it's about what you live. And when the law lives inside of you, you treat image bearers with dignity, honor, and respect. The church of Jesus Christ should not be known for stifling the voice of women, for sexual assault against women, It should be known as the greatest supporters and encouragers of image bearers, not just women, but of every people, every group, because we're one family in Christ, right? Amen? Amen. Why? Because the law lives inside our hearts, and God's been more than generous with us. And there is a wedding that's going to happen. This story ends in a wedding because one day Jesus ends this whole story with a wedding feast. All right. But was we ready to wrap this thing up? Okay. So what's one of the outstanding questions that we have here? We've talked about the law. We've talked about the, the, the feast and so forth. All magnifying Jesus. But what's one of the other things that we're here? What's going to be the story around Bethlehem? What's the lasting reputation going to be? How is that going to get in any way salvaged? Because we have a Bethlehem priest who leads the people in idolatry. We have a Bethlehem concubine who's sexually assaulted. And then we have a man from Bethlehem who at the beginning of Ruth leads his family out because of brokenness and sin. And he's just away from God and there's death. All this death and sorrow. Well, in order for us to understand, to be able to answer the question, we've got to go to the word of God. And we've got to ask ourselves, where is the place that Bethlehem is first mentioned? Perhaps it could give us insight into the story. So we're going to go to Genesis It'll be up on the screen. And here we go, Genesis 35, starting in verse 16. This is with Jacob and his wife, Rachel. It says, Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had a hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, or son of sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. So Rachel died and was buried 
on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem means fruitfulness, to bear fruit. So the first time Bethlehem is mentioned in the scriptures is with this name Ephrath, right, which means fruitfulness. But what we're watching is that here in the story of Israel, which is the story of Jacob, we have a wife who's pregnant, and in the, in the delivery, she dies, and her last words are, you are a son of sorrow. But now the father jumps in and says, no, you're going to be called the son of the right hand. It doesn't mean that the first name didn't exist. He's not one name or the other. He's both. He started as the son of sorrow, but he finishes as the son of the right hand. And he's from where? Bethlehem. What will be the legacy of Bethlehem? Its foundation and its first mention in Scripture is that there is a man associated with sorrow who finishes as the son of the right hand. Isaiah 53, what does it say about Jesus? He is despised and rejected by men. A man of what? Sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our what? Yet we esteemed him stricken. Smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace fell upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The story of Bethlehem here is that there is a son of sorrow, and that's his name because there is death because of sin. But this man who what magnifies the law, who's above the law, What happens? Death comes when we violate the law, but what happens when you have no sin in you? What happens when you not only meet all of the commandments, but you exceed and are greater than the commandments? That even when your body dies, death has no authority over your body. When Jesus went into the ground, he was a man without sin, and therefore the grave could not hold him. He had to what? Rise. The son of sorrow becomes what? The son of the right hand. This is why it says in Acts chapter 2, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, what, sit at my, what, right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both what, Lord, Yahweh, and what, Christ, Messiah. He is risen And he's at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says that we have a high priest over our confession who is able to empathize with us because he died for our sorrow and he has risen back to life. Therefore, let us run into the way and find mercy and grace in our time of need. What's going to be the story of Bethlehem? It's the son of sorrow, but it doesn't stay there. He's the son of the right hand. This is why it prophesies in Micah. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old. Bethlehem means house of bread. Jesus is the bread that has come down out of heaven. Jesus is the one who has broken the bread of his life open. He became the man of sorrows broken for us, that he might become the one at the right hand of the Father, son of sorrow, son of the right hand. And Bethlehem's story will be, I bring salvation, and how it starts is not how it finishes. So if you put your faith in him, it doesn't matter how your story starts. Because Ecclesiastes says the end of a matter is better than its beginning. And if Jesus is the son of sorrow who's become the son of the right hand, it doesn't matter how great the sorrow is in your life or my life because of sin. The trauma, the tragedy, all of that can be here. But the man of sorrows has carried it. The man of sorrows has had it on his shoulder. The man of sorrows was buried for it. And then the man of the right hand rose over it. That's why this story takes place at a gate. Remember that? Why is that significant? Because when you look at like we did last week, Boaz is from Tamar descendant. Where did Tamar's deception start? It started at a gate outside the city with Judah. What about Ruth, the Moabite? Ruth's story starts with Lot when he's outside the gate of Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know what your gate or gates look like. 
I don't know where it went wrong for you. I don't know where you, you, you deceived and lied, maybe where you were assaulted, maybe you raped or whatever the case may be. All of the trauma and the tragedy and the heaviness is real. But I'm here to tell you there is a son of sorrow from Bethlehem that the law testifies is greater than the law. And he has paid the price on the cross for you and for me. And no matter where your gate or your story is, he goes back and he is able to redeem your past. He's able to redeem the broken moments so they are no longer places of hardship. They're no longer places that destroy you, but they're places where you get up and testify. I'm forgiven. I'm restored. I'm raised up. There are places in my life that years ago, if I went back to, it could produce anxiety or I, I'm so, I remember all the failure. Those things have been annihilated because of the man who was buried in the ground, who was exalted to be at the right hand of the Father. Tombstones become stepping stones. All of that. There are places where I can praise God from. There were places of weeping before because of the man who could not be held in the grave. The man from Bethlehem. He's got the greater story. Now let's wrap this up. Boaz, without Ruth's story, we don't really know Boaz, do we? Ruth and Boaz are pretty ordinary people when you think about it. Just living their lives, being faithful. Ruth actually takes time to care for her mother-in-law. And in simply caring for her mother-in-law, the Lord begins to open up blessing for her. What can some kindness do in your life from the Lord, extended towards other people that you view as ordinary, but heaven takes notice of, and actually opens up blessing for you? What's it like when you can love an enemy in the opposite spirit that they give? And what can God begin to open up when you love the unlovely? See, Ruth tells us that those type of things God sees. What happens when you can show, like Boaz did, generosity to a stranger? What can your generosity unlock? Both Boaz and Ruth don't go the way that their past has with deception. But when it comes to marriage, they do things that are honorable. They treat the institution with the respect it's worthy of and the one who gave it. No matter what the culture says, no matter what is being said, they say, we're gonna take what God has provided and treat it with honor. What happens when we begin to esteem the things that God esteems, no matter what the world has said? What happens when we live behind the truths that God has said and we honor them simply and honorably, even when no one's looking. What can open up in your life, right? Just some things to think about. And last thing I'll say is this. We good? Because next week we're gonna be ruthless, so let's go. All right. Ten Commandments all bear witness that this is the man. And actually the commandments can't even keep up with the man who's double the law. We've read in the book of Judges, we we hear about the broken people, Samson, Jephthah, and there are others. But even when you begin to look at some of the other people we've looked at over the last couple months, David is a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but at times not a very good dad. There's Abraham. Man, the the patriarch, the faith. Yeah, but two times he lied about his wife, so he was trying to seek self-preservation. Liar, liar, pants on fire. (laughs) Jacob, oh, what if the 12 tribes come out of Jacob? Have you read about Jacob's family? (laughs) In fact, if you're having family drama, don't go to a counselor. I'm being being joking for a second. Read Jacob's family first. If it doesn't make things right in your family, then go to a counselor, okay? That's facetious, but stay with me. 
What about Jeremiah? You go through Isaiah. You go, you go through all these people in the book, and you're like, some of these, Peter, like awesome moments. Wow, really bad moments. Paul, wow, Paul, 14 books in the New Testament. You know, approximately, depending on authorship and what's argued, whatever, right? But also, Paul, whoa, man, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, pre-Jesus. You, man, you had, you had some history, bud. You had a few gates in your life, buddy. And you look at all this, and, and, and why, why does the book of Ruth stand out? Why does Ruth get, get, get her own book what, with its own name? And here's why. It's only four chapters, but the book of Ruth accentuates a man who goes above and beyond the law. And what it's reminding us of is that this whole entire Bible, that every single book amplifies one name and one man. And there are good men and good women, all broken, but leading after God. And even the best of the best of the best on their best day never can match up to the law, never could fulfill all of the commandments. Don't even come into the same category as this man. The whole book, it's set aside to accentuate that there's a man from Bethlehem who became the man of sorrows, whom death could not hold in the ground. And he is the focus of the scriptures. He's the epicenter of all things. He's the divine son of man and he's worthy of worship and honor and adoration and he is the only deliverer suitable for Israel and the nations and his name is Jesus, <laughs> Lamb of God. And he's worthy. So it's incredibly encouraging that we can experience forgiveness but we're reminded that there's only one name. There's a greater Boaz, and his name is Jesus. Have we received God's word here? Come on, come on, have we enjoyed the book of Ruth? Come on, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Mosaic Law behind me. Father, we just thank you right now. Thank you, Lord. We just begin to bless you in the name of, come on, just begin to thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, thank you, Lord, that, Lord, that you've brought us into the story. Jesus, that when you looked at our lives, you said, I am willing to pay the price. Lord, that you became man to become our kin, one like us, but so much greater than us. Lord, that you not only walked and fulfilled the law, Lord, you did above and beyond, and you have been far more generous than is even required. Lord, thank you for this incredible grace. Come on, if you know the name of Jesus, just begin to thank him for a grace. Come on, thank him that he said, I was willing when he saw you. Come on, when he saw us, he said, I'm willing. Some of you just, you, you've never heard people say, I'm willing. Maybe it's been once in a lifetime. But man, I'm here, I'm here to tell you that Jesus sees you and says he's willing. He understands what he's getting. This is the great exchange. He gets our brokenness. We get his wholeness. He takes our unrighteousness, we get his righteousness. What a beautiful exchange. Lord, we thank you, we bless you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for this love that has brought in the nations. Thank you, Lord, that you've done what's required to secure the land where you've made your promises, God. Lord, thank you that you have, Lord, that you are a Hebrew who died for the Hebrews. Lord, that you're Messiah and Savior and we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that the glory of the Lord shall fill the earth and every tribe, every nation, every tongue will worship the Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord, that on Passover you were so incredibly generous with us more than we deserved and you've poured out your spirit. Most some of you need to know, you're not just forgiven, but the power of the Holy Spirit resides in you right now. And Lord, I thank you for changing the story of gates in our lives right now in Jesus' name. Lord, gates where we've been deceptive, gates of lying in the past, gates of dishonesty, gates of sin, gates where trauma has happened, gates at which we suffered abuse, gates that have produced anxiety in us because of what sin has done. But Lord, we thank you right now. Come on, if this is you, just open your heart. We thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, that you're the one who redeems stories and you walk stories all the way back in places that have been points of anxiety or condemnation, Lord, are broken by the blood of Jesus. And Father, I thank you right now that you would speak even as you calm the storm, that you would calm the voices and eradicate the voices of the past. You redeem stories, God. 
Father, and I thank you that there are places we're going to be able to go, whether it's in our mind. Father, whether it's in certain places where things have happened that we'll be able to go and testify, God has raised me from here. This no longer bears weight on me, but Jesus has healed me. Jesus has forgiven me. I am the righteousness of God. I am loved. Someone was willing to change the story. And his name is the Lamb of God. His name is Jesus, who is Christ, King. Thank you, Lord. Just with head bowed, so I just if you're here today and you've been away from the Lord or you don't know Jesus, you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins and come and reside inside of you, which is what he wants to do. He desires to fill your most and most being. If that's you, I want you to pray with me. Just say, Jesus, I believe you are God's son from Bethlehem. You are the man of sorrow who died for my sins. And you are also the man who rose to bring life in me. I choose to follow you now, to believe in you now, in your name. That's why heads are bowed. We say amen to that prayer. Just keep your heads bowed. If you know you needed to pray with me today, if you're saying I'm, I'm grabbing a hold of Jesus, I don't care if it's for the first time or you've just been so far away, but you know you needed to pray today, I'm going to count to three for you to raise your hand. You don't have to wait. Come on, one, who wanted to pray with me? Yeah, I see. Come on, two, I wonder who else was saying, yeah, that's me, Pastor. Come on, three, yeah, I see, I see, I see. All right, come on, can we put our heads up? Come on, let's put our hands together. Come on. Come on, praise God for what he does. When we get together, we bless him. Listen, I want to encourage you, share your decision with someone today. Come down, share it with someone in the prayer line or go to our Welcome Center. We want to connect you with our app that we have. There's some great resources on there to help you begin to grow. But also, we want you to come back to church on a regular basis, okay? Now, listen, in, in light of the events of the world, we're going to just conclude in prayer, all right? Go lift things up as we go. And Fall Festival this coming Saturday. So, Father, we just, what a privilege we have to gather here today, but we're not disconnected from the one who has redeemed the land and the people and the nations of the earth. So, Lord, our hearts cry, would you break the cycle of violence? Lord, we're asking for you to intervene now, Lord, that your mercy would be demonstrated all over from Israel to Lebanon to Jordan into Gaza, Palestine. Father, into Egypt, make its way to Iran and Turkey. Would there be an awakening to the divine man, we pray? Lord, even before Esther found herself in trouble, Lord, you had planted her to be a solution. We ask for courage now to be infused in the church. Lord, right there in the Middle East and right here in America, to be a voice for the Lamb of God and to be a voice for Israel in dark hour when rage exists and to contend for the people there. Palestine. May you find a people who love you this much that we demonstrate the cross in and through our lives. We commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you guys. Go in the grace of God.